Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Clean water is one of our most valuable resources. Conserving it should be all of our responsibility. Remember every day to make every drop count. Wash full loads, take shorter showers, turn off your faucet. Water, use it wisely. Let's commit to conserve. And by SciComm Technologies, celebrating 20 years in IT. SciComm is dedicated to helping customers stay on top of the tech wave, whatever comes next, online at SciComTech.com. Lots of fun on the way in this episode of Flying Squirrels Insider. This week, we take a trip to the land down under with super sidearm pitcher Tyler Rogers. The gang shows us what can happen during a rain delay, reverting back to their younger years with a little wiffle ball. And we take a sip of espresso with reliever Tyler Mazinko. And lastly, the squirrels community bonds are on display yet again with Ask Foundation Night at the Diamond. It's been a slow start on the field for the team, but we're running at full speed here on FSI. And welcome back here to Flying Squirrels Insider. I'm your host, Jay Burnham. Going to be joined by my broadcast partner, Greg Caserta, to get into it in just a moment. But first, a reminder that Utility Buddy from the City of Richmond Department of Public Utilities makes us aware of rain that falls on hard surface areas which can pick up pollutants and carry them into Richmond's waterways without being treated. Help keep our waterways clean. Call 646-7000 or visit richmondgov.com and click storm water utility. Also, we're giving away free stuff yet again. Scratch to win. Text FSI to 63975. Mobile marketing services provided by Optin Technologies. Messages and data rates may apply. No purchase necessary. With that said, we'll dive into the Flying Squirrels first 30 plus games of the season and Greg Caserta, Richmond 10 and 22 to start the year. Not exactly ideal. What's wrong? I think it's a little bit of that old baseball adage, when you're pitching well, you're not hitting well, and vice versa. So you put all that aside and you look at this team and how it's been comprised, and I think that the common theme, talking to a lot of these players, is that they realize that they've underperformed, and it has been a disappointing start to the season, but I think everybody also feels that one game or one moment can kind of incite a turnaround, and they're hoping that it comes sooner rather than later. And they've had a lot of close contests, games going into extra innings. In fact, the Squirrels uh, dropped a heartbreaker last Wednesday at the Diamond by a final of 2-1, to one, but it's not for a lack of effort. This team continues to show poise at the end of games scoring late, and that uh, is pretty much uh, configuring with what Miguel Ojeda brings to the table. His energy and excitement allows this team to uh, thrive later in games. Everybody calls him Miggy, and the guys like playing for him. He's easy to get along with. He's very laid back. And as you said, th this team does like to score late. If you look at the inning-by-inning inning scoring breakdown, they save their best for the eighth and the ninth. Now, that's all well and good if you're leading in ball games. Unfortunately, they've been playing from behind too often and that creates issues for the bullpen because now they're coming in hoping to not make a mistake and the offense realizes hey we better turn it on but it's come a little bit too late so I think that if they can get those early leads they have the pieces in place that they can protect them it just hasn't happened up to this point too often. Well speaking of the offense this offense has been in terms of batting average one of the best right. in the league and they actually lost their three hole hitter Austin Slater for a span of about 10 days with a slight injury Slater came back with a vengeance had a five hit game at the Diamond uh, last week and uh, continues to be the middle of the order hitter that the Squirrels had expected him to. So I know it wasn't a long absence for Slater, but certainly you felt it over the course of 10 days. And I spoke to him right after he returned from the disabled list and he gave us the sense that it was needed maybe to get away, not how you'd want to do it because of an injury, but it gave him some time to assess some things, work on a couple of things. And as you said, he came back with a vengeance. He had that five hit game. He's starting to drive the ball a little bit better. His turnaround has coincided with the reemergence of Hunter Cole and you get the two of them performing simultaneously and that's a big boost especially with Ricky Oropesa in the middle of that lineup. Yeah Cole is a guy that really struggled at the start of the season and now is starting to to get back to where he was last year. I know I was uh, telling you time and time again uh, that last year he was one of the more impressive hitters with the sound of the ball coming off his bat and now you're starting to see it. And it's good to see because yeah. you, you were waiting for it to happen. I think he suffered through that 0 for 18 or 0 for 19 start to begin the year. Suddenly the ball 
balls flying a little bit more. Now, he hasn't hit a home run yet, but you feel like it's coming. And I think overall, the power on this team has been spread out pretty well. Tyler Horan has three home runs. His rise, I guess, coincided with Slater going to the DL. Mm -hmm. So Horan, who is really, as the fourth outfielder coming into the season, started seeing more playing time in left field. It put Miles Schroeder in center, and it gave you an extra left-handed bat in the lineup, which is always good. Yeah, you get an opportunity for a guy to uh, take a, a look at, at extra playing time with uh, Slater on the on the shelf. And Tyler Horan with three home runs right off the bat, the Virginia Tech product. So he might start to see some more playing time for this offense. Now, the offense at times has been clicking. Unfortunately, the pitching hasn't uh, coincided with that. As you mentioned, they've been on and off, uh, not matching up with one another. But we've already seen some promotions to AAA. Let's start with Yoan Gregorio, a guy that I know a lot of Giants fans are starting to look at. Yeah, he's on the 40-man roster and he added some weight. And this is a guy that came in when he was signed as a free agent. He was 6'7", 180 pounds. He's put on about 50, 60 pounds worth of muscle. So when he releases from the mound, he's right on top of you and he has really good stuff. And if you look at his numbers in the Eastern League, he had an 0-2 record, but a lot of these extra stats that you look at, he ranked right near the top of the league. So he played himself right out of here. It created an opportunity for him for the first time at AAA. And because he's young and because he has that big presence on the mound, it really bodes well for him if, let's say, something happens in San Francisco. Yeah, which uh, people are speculating about the, the Giants rotation towards the back end having some struggles, and Gregorio could be a guy that uh, makes his major league debut at some point this season. Now, the first number that jumps off the page at you is the six foot seven. He throws downhill. He doesn't throw in the mid-90s. He throws in the low-90s, 91, 92, but he's been able to mix his pitches a lot better this year, and Gregorio certainly deserving that promotion to AAA. Now, he is just the second guy already this season to go up to AAA. Jose Casilla, the reliever, was the first, and so you're starting to see this upward mobility for this team. And then that kind of segues into who is next, and if you're looking at position players, you're not really sure. It's a little more clear-cut. I think Tyler Beatty would be the most logical candidate. Based on what he's done over his last few starts, he's starting to pitch like an ace. He's starting to show you why the Giants made him a first-round pick. And uh, if it wasn't for that unfortunate ball that got away from Lucas Giolito, there was that matchup between the two top prospects for both the Giants and the Nationals. Beatty was humming, and he was dealing with five scoreless innings, had to come out of that game for precautionary reasons, but he will make his next start scheduled, and if he goes like this, he won't be here for very long. Yeah, I know a lot of scouts and uh, prognosticators watching some of Beatty's starts say he's Almost a different pitcher than where he was last year. Last year in his first full season as a pro. Kind of uh, waned down the stretch a little bit this year. He's bulked up some. Mm -hmm. He's throwing the fastball in the mid-90s. He's only utilizing three or four pitches. I think last year he was trying to mix in six or seven different styles of pitch. So uh, Beatty certainly is a guy that could uh, rise rapidly through the ranks. And that bodes well for the Flying Squirrels and the Giants fan base who want to see him thrive. Now, his... Uh, Gregorio's departure leaves an opening in the rotation and that we're going to see on this current homestand a guy that was drafted last year by San Francisco, Andrew Suarez. Andrew Suarez, the Miami product, a 2015 draft choice. He will be making his first start at the Diamond soon against the curve. And we're really looking forward to that because Steve Klein talked about him several weeks ago, talking about some younger guys in San Jose. And Suarez was somebody he mentioned, a left-hander who throws fairly hard, not overpowering, not mid-90s, but great control, great command of the strike zone, and his numbers in the hitter-friendly California League really strong to start the year. And he'll be throwing to a veteran catcher, Steve LaRude, who has taken over the starting duties for this team. They call him Rudy, at least Parney does. Yeah. And we've been around Steve quite a bit. He's a very personable guy. He's been around the block. He's had a couple of tours with some Eastern League teams. And now he's here in Richmond. And I think we, you and I talked about it. The rise of Tyler Beatty and some of these other starters has coincided with LaRude's arrival giving them that veteran presence behind the plate because there's no situation that he hasn't dealt with. And so far, he's been a really good soldier behind the plate for this team. And it's good to see a guy that has a little bit of big league time really take over behind the dish. Unfortunately, Matt Wynn sent down to Augusta. He'll be back uh, soon enough, you'd think. Bullpen has had a couple of hiccups, but overall, it's been pretty solid. Yeah, it has. And you look at Dan Slaney as somebody who we featured on the most recent episode of FSI. Uh, he showed us his combination of pitches. And uh, the last couple of outings, he's given up a few home runs, so you don't want to see that. But I think that Dan just kind of goes, okay, it's part of the season. He's going to get back to where he was because for the first month of the season, 
He was as dominant as it gets. Ray Black is starting to put things together now. The control issues have not resurfaced. And if Jake Smith starts to come around, there's that trio that we talked about coming into the season, and that's a really nice weapon to have. And Tyler Rogers still has not allowed an earned run. Thanks a lot, Craig. You got it, Jay. All right, the Flying Squirrels off to a bit of a slow start on the field. However, off the field, we're in mid-season form humming towards the end of April. Now the start of May, we had our favorite night at the ballpark with the Ask Foundation, and here's what it looked like. with Amy Godkin, our special guest here tonight, and she is with the Ask Foundation. Amy, just tell us a little bit about the Ask Foundation for those people that might not be familiar with it. Sure, Ask is a local nonprofit. It was started back in 1975 by parents of patients who are going through cancer treatment, and they realized that there wasn't a lot of support available. So they gathered together and started raising funds and um, putting together support groups. And Ask is that organization that steps in and fills in all the gaps that the medical care doesn't do. Um, the child life special that hangs out with the kids in the clinic. There's a chaplain that they provide, the educational coordinator. Um, so really just letting kids be kids when they're going through cancer. The Fine Squirrels have been an amazing community partner for us. Um, the Walk is our biggest single fundraiser and it raises over $150,000 each year in unrestricted general support that can go to any program in our area of greatest need. But this event also represents um, a celebration for all of our kids, both the ones who are with us here today and the children we've lost during the year. So what's the most gratifying part of all of this? So my favorite part of the walk is the Courageous Kids Victory Lap. Um, to see our patients and survivors take a lap around the bases and to see the entire stadium stand up and cheer for them is just amazing. The players are so good with them. They look forward to it. They feel like they're meeting, you know, rock stars. And a huge thanks to the Ask Foundation for coming out here. That night is quickly becoming uh, one of our favorite nights at the ballpark. We're here at the field in front of the bullpen, joined by Tyler Rogers, one of the uh, astute members of this Flying Squirrels pen. Tyler, thanks for taking the time, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I want to talk about your delivery. It's a pretty unique one. We're going to get a, a close-up look at it here in a moment. But first and foremost, you're a guy from Colorado. You went to school in Tennessee. How did your journey begin? Well, I... I uh... I guess I started my journey after high school. I went to junior college in southwest Kansas at Garden City Community College. And uh, there's where I learned how to throw submarine or sidearm or whatever you want to call it. And um, yeah, I just kind of evolved from there. And then Austin P saw me in junior college. And then I was like, all right, let's Did go. Did they out take there. you one day and say, hey, uh, this isn't working, mm -hmm. Tyler? We need you to throw it down here. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, in a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, they're like, we want to try uh, throwing sidearm or whatever. And then I just kept getting lower and lower and it just it kept evolving. And it's evolved into something more than I thought it would, but we'll keep riding it. It's the extreme degree of sidearming. Mm -hmm. Do you watch other sidearmers, maybe some of the big leagues or some that you've seen in the minor leagues and say, hey, I can learn something from that guy? Or do you try to pick up different pointers from guys that throw from that angle? Yeah, every once in a while I'll see. There's, there's not too many of them. but. Uh, I'll, I'll try and watch him, but I, that's what I like about my delivery is it's, is it's unique and it's, and it's mine. Like yeah. It's different than everybody else's, and I like that. We had uh, Edwin Kidarte who threw from a different angle than you did, but he would always tell us uh, over the past couple of years that he'd throw it at the middle of the plate, and sometimes he wouldn't know where the ball was going. It had a lot of movement to it. Is that yeah. the same approach that you have? Pretty close. To some it, day, some days yeah. that is the approach, yes, but... Uh, yeah, mostly just, just pitching the contact and letting the ball move whichever way it wants to and hopefully get some ground balls. You're from a baseball family. Your brother actually made his big league debut this year with the Minnesota Twins. Did you call him right after he had that special moment? Or did he call you? Oh, he called me yeah. when, uh, when he got the call up or whatever, and he, he made sure he called me first. He told me, he's like, I wanted to tell you first, and that was, that was really a... Uh, it meant a lot to me that he wanted to, he waited two hours to tell everybody, anybody wow. because he wanted to tell me first. And yeah, I was just overwhelmed with joy. And I ran in, we were taking BP when he, when he made his debut, so I ran in and watched it in the clubhouse. And it, it was, uh, yeah, I wish there was 
the word to describe it. It's even better than you think. Is that you said. Yeah. almost additional motivation for you to, to, to see your brother get up there and say, mm -hmm. okay, uh, it's doable because I probably beat him sometimes when we were playing it as, as kids. Yeah, I beat him up all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you could say, well, if he can get up there, well, then so can I. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, it's like a big, big mythical dream, you know, yeah. when we're in the minor leagues, but uh, he made it become a reality, you know, so I think it, it shows, shows me that it is possible. But, yeah, it does add, add a little extra motivation. And this bullpen that the Squirrels have had over the past several years, Josh Osich, Hunter Strickland, Derek Law, I think all three of those guys pitched in the Giants' extra inning game last, year, uh, last night. So you can see that upward mobility is there for San Francisco. Opportunities yeah, there for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, hopefully it bodes well that I'm, I bring something a little different to the table. We hope not to jinx you. 15 games, no earned runs allowed. So at least so far, things are going well for you this year. Yeah, so far I've been able to keep keep the ball down and get ahead in counts and let the defense help me out. So hopefully, keep that rolling. Sounds good. Well, you want to give us a little bit of peek at to you know how you actually do it because there's probably kids out there mm -hmm. who uh, throw from over the top, but they might not be able to get to the next level. Yeah. And for you, that certainly panned out. You want to show us how? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Great. We'll take a look at Tyler Rogers' delivery, how he does it, and uh, how it actually works right after this. But first. I was able to sit down with another member of the Flying Squirrels bullpen, Tyler Mazinko, for a little bit of a cup of coffee at Stir Crazy Cafe. Those socks. Those are pretty cool. Those are your wedding socks, right? So I got married in these babies. So you broke your toe, like one of your first outings. Right next to that, like right in there. You were supposed to be out six to eight weeks. You came back in like two. No shot I was doing six to eight weeks. There's no way, it's way too long. <laughs> After three days, I was bored. Dude, it's very rare that you'll move around to a minor league city and want to live there permanently, but you and your wife are actually uh, looking for a place to live. I never thought I'd want to live in a city where I played minor league baseball. You're a Patriots fan. I'm a Patriots fan. The Tom Brady deflake is just a bunch of malarkey. It's a conspiracy. It's they're just out. To, they're just out to get Tom because they're jealous of him. And right. If he is suspended, they'll win four games. If he isn't suspended, they'll win four games. <laughs> You're known as a ground ball pitcher. That's been your calling card. Getting the double plays. Has that always been a talent of yours? Junior summer, going into senior year of high school, I, I learned a little about pitching. I was closing for a summer ball team, and then senior year of high school, I pitched for my high school team. And I just progressively got better, and then once I got to college, they sort of taught me a sinker, and I just rolled with it. There are four Tylers on the team. Tyler Rogers is Tyler Scott. I'm Tyler Scott. Then we got Tyler Roy, who is Tyler Horn, and then Tyler Joseph, who is Tyler Beatty. So we got T. Joe, Tyro, Tysco, and Tisco. And that's what we go with. Show us what you uh, what you have for pitches, how you hold uh, the baseball. Yeah, so I got the uh, I got the two seam fastball here. That's pretty much my standard, right? My standard go to. Uh -huh. when I'm feeling frisky. I'll I'll throw the four seam, try and zoom it, but mostly just to stay with the two seam. You get a little then, more movement with the two seam. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. And then uh, I got the uh, the slider, the frisbee slider. I just kind of grip right there. Now stay there. When you're finishing your delivery, do you? twist at all? Is there anything different that you do with your, yeah, with with, your wrist? With the slider, it's like, uh, it's real, real wristy and handsy. It's like, it's like the uh, Frisbee golf course, you know, you're just going to throw that Frisbee in there like that. And I, yeah, I just kind of get around it. And, and then it has incredible that movement away from a hitter. Yeah, it kind of floats in there yeah. a little bit. Yeah. The old flutter ball sometimes. All right now, before, yeah. uh, before you actually 
duck and dive, how do you how do you start with your feet? What are you what are you doing first? Yeah, yeah, I'll get I'll get set just like uh, any normal pitcher, a little little open, and then uh, I go into just a little bit of a modified leg kick. Just modified one of these leg kick here. right here, yeah. as opposed to up here like this. Yeah, I like come across a little bit lower. Tad. Yeah, and then this is where you and then what well, you call it the, the duck, duck and chuck. Duck and chuck. Yeah, I just come down here, duck and. Well, now, when loose. you first started out, you were you said you, you maybe have kind of been here. Yeah, right? I'm, yeah. I think when I first started, I was maybe just a little sidearm, and then it was like a game of limbo. Yeah. To see how yeah. well you could go. Yeah. All right, so let's yeah. see the full. Yeah. So the full the one. Full length is, here. Is here, and then just right there, to where his hand almost brushes against the the dirt of the grass. Mm -hmm. uh, dirt of the grass. Do you ever? Uh, do you ever? Touch the dirt. I've never, on the mound. never, no? never touched the, never got the knuckles scraped. But All right. Maybe I'm getting close. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's it. If if kids uh, want to kind of reinvent themselves as a pitcher, maybe try mm -hmm. to, to 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 throw from that low angle. Yeah. You know, mess with it. Try it. And it's you're around 80 to 90 miles an hour, right? Depending on what pitch you're throwing. Yeah, it will go mid 80s. Okay. We'll All right. I was giving yeah. you a couple miles yeah, an hour. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. If you're out at the diamond, uh, make sure you see Tyler Rogers. He's going to pitch in most of the Flying Squirrels games this year, as he is an everyday man out of the bullpen for head coach Miguel Ojeda. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you. All right. Great. We go to the road. That's next here on Flying Squirrels Insider. On the road with the Richmond Flying Squirrels. Once again, we're back here in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Uh, trust me, we do travel to other places in the Eastern League. However, it just works out that the schedule takes us to Altoona. So last time we showed you what the Altoona, Pennsylvania ballpark looked like. This time, we're going to take a look behind the scenes as to why the Altoona Curve are named the Altoona Curve. This is a very rail-heavy town, and we're here at the world-famous Horseshoe Curve. Now, of course, the curve is a pitch in baseball, but it's also an engineering marvel that put Altoona on the map back in the 1850s, and we're going to take a look at what that actually looks like for train travel nowadays. We're about to take one of these bad boys up to the top of the horseshoe curve. It's a funicular, something we probably should have at the Diamond back in Richmond. Now it's two cable cars that counterbalance each other's weight, evenly distributed. It allows one car to go up and the other car to come down. And we're about to go up to the horseshoe curve. All right, I'm here at the world famous horseshoe curve, the apex of it where it really rolls through the Allegheny Mountains. And hopefully we're gonna catch a train come passing by here pretty soon. At one point, over 160 trains would come through these mountains each and every day. That was built in 1854. Nowadays, about 50 to 60 trains are utilized through this mountain range. Now, at one point, this engineering marvel connected Philadelphia, the East Coast, with the Midwest, Chicago, and the rest of the United States. Always great catching up with Jay, showing us how life on the road really is. Now that we've seen Altoona twice, next stop on the journey, Trenton, New Jersey. Jay's old stomping grounds, my home state. Can't wait to check that one out. Next, we'll take a look at what goes on during a rain delay. Jay and Dan Slania were goofing around a little bit, playing a little wiffle ball, and that's a lot of fun. So, thanks for joining us on Flying Squirrels Insider. I'm Greg Caserta, and we'll see you in two weeks. We're giving away these wiffle ball bats this week at the Diamond. It's been rainy last week here at the ballpark, you may have noticed. So during a rain delay, the players will play some cards. They might uh, watch some TV or, in our case, play some wiffle ball. We're here in the batting cage. We've got these wiffle ball giveaways, and we're going to throw some pitches to Dan Slania. Maybe if I get a lot of drop, if I, if I cover up 
We'll Not see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right, here comes the palm ball. Oh. Dodgers. Oh. Ball two. Now it's my turn to see what Dan's got. Wiffle ball style. Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Smell gas? Act fast. Don't just stand there. Leave the area. Get out. Go where the smell is no longer present and call 911. Making you aware, keeping you safe. We're Richmond's Natural Gas Safety Awareness Program. And by SICOM Technologies. Celebrating 20 years in IT. SICOM is dedicated to helping customers stay on top of the tech wave, whatever comes next, online at SICOMTech.com.